Good morning and welcome to another edition of Cosmic Coffee here at Lowell Observatory. Uh, we've got a really exciting show for you today. Uh, we're going off onto um, a bit of a different path in cultural astronomy. So uh, first, uh, we'll make some introductions and talk about the different uh, cultures. First, uh, we'll uh, make some introductions and we'll talk about the what we'll be talking about. Uh, and um, then we'll uh, look through uh, the sky that we can see right now and uh, look at how different star groupings are um, viewed across different cultures. So uh, it should be really fun. Uh, so I am uh, Dr. Danielle Adams. I'm uh, one of the deputy directors here at Lowell Observatory, uh, deputy director for marketing and communications. And um, uh, my research is in uh, Arabian cultural astronomy. So uh, I'll be talking about Arabia uh, when I get to those parts. Um, and then we have uh, Kyler, uh, Kyler Keen, who is uh, our deputy director for technology. And Kyler, why don't you say hi? Good morning. Uh, looking forward to telling you about uh, Aboriginal Australian astronomy. Um, I'm not a cultural astronomer, by no means an expert, but prior to my time at Lowell Observatory, I was at the Australian Astronomical Observatory. So I had uh, some exposure to Aboriginal astronomy, some of the, the tens of thousands of years of heritage that, that the um, different cultures and different people groups there have. So I'm going to share at least a little bit about that with you. And I will also drop in the chat uh, some, some names of people who are experts. So if you want more information, you can go look them up. Awesome. And in addition to Dr. Keen, we've got Dr. West, uh, Michael West, who is our Deputy Director for Science. And uh, welcome, Michael. Morning, Danielle. Morning, everyone. Thanks for joining us. Um, yeah, my, I'm going to share a little bit of my uh, limited knowledge of uh, Hawaiian astronomy today. Um, I spent seven years as a professor at the University of Hawaii, and I was the lead astronomy content developer for the Imiloa Astronomy Center in Hawaii, uh, which brings together Hawaiian culture and the science of astronomy as sort of a, a, a tale of human exploration. So I'll share uh, some of what I know about Hawaiian uh, astronomy as well. Awesome. So um, let me share our um, world map just to give everyone uh, a sense for uh, the places we'll be visiting today. So here, of course, uh, you can see the US and Flagstaff uh, right here, uh, where Lowell Observatory is located. So uh, this is our, you know, for us here, of course, our starting frame of reference. Um, but if we zoom out a bit, we're going literally around the world. So uh, when I speak about Arabian astronomy, we're looking at this region, uh, mostly the Arabian Peninsula. Uh, one thing that's interesting there is that um, from the bottom of the peninsula around Sana'a in Yemen, up to the top uh, near the area of Baghdad, uh, there's something like a 15 degree difference in latitude, uh, maybe more towards 20. And so, um, you know, around the world, if you're at the same latitude, your sky is pretty much the same. It just comes up at different times as your locality gets dark. But when you change latitudes, north and south, that changes how much of the northern and southern sky you see. And as we'll see when we get to um, Kyler's uh, area, um, it also changes uh, orientations of constellations that um, you may find familiar. So here um, in the Arabian Peninsula, uh, Peninsula, there's a lot of north and south difference. Uh, as we move across, uh, around the world, uh, when we look at um, Kyler's um, uh, area that he's going to be talking about, we are looking at um, here in Australia for Aboriginal Australia, but then also up here in this region for the Torres Strait Islanders. And so again, here you have a, about a 15 degree difference in latitude. 
Uh, and then, um, and then that of course is in the Southern hemisphere. So things will be different. And then here uh, we've got Hawaii. And so this is what Michael will be speaking of. So we've got really um, a wide variety of regions that we'll be looking at, uh, which should make for uh, a rather exciting time. Uh, Michael, uh, you wanted to uh, share a little bit about uh, Hawaiian culture. Uh, why don't you go ahead and do that? Okay, thanks, Daniel. Yeah, I just wanted to give a bit of a, a context to people about uh, Hawaiian astronomy. So let me share my screen really quick. Um, so the Hawaiians were great astronomers. Uh, there's a quote I really like from Queen Liliuokalani, who was Hawaii's last monarch before the kingdom was uh, illegally overthrown in 1893. Um, and in her memoir, she wrote, the ancient Hawaiians were astronomers. And, and it's so true. Um, astronomy and knowledge of the stars impacted so many parts of Hawaiian culture from daily life to, as I'll talk about, their ability to navigate across thousands of miles of open ocean. Uh, so there were great, great astronomers. There's even um, a Hawaiian proverb which says, the stars are the eyes of heaven. Um, so it, it was the stars that uh, uh, originally brought the um, first settlers to Hawaii. And astronomers were so esteemed. They were called kilohoku. Hoku is the Hawaiian word for star. Uh, and they were among the most esteemed members of Hawaiian society. They played a really vital role in uh, everything, uh, all different components. Um, King David Kalakaua, also known as the Merry Monarch, uh, loved astronomy. He uh, did a world, he traveled the world to visit other heads of state in the 1880s. He visited Lick Observatory in California and he brought the first telescope to Hawaii in 1883. It was a five inch telescope, the first permanent telescope, I should say. Uh, so he loved astronomy as well. And again, it was an important part of the heritage of the Hawaiian people. Uh, this is a International Space Station shot of the Hawaiian Islands. You see the big island of Hawaii uh, down here at the right. Uh, and then you see the other islands in the chain. Um, it's one of the most geographically isolated spots on Earth. So how do people end up there? How could they navigate across, you know, vast distances of open ocean? And the way they did that was using their knowledge of the stars to determine direction. Uh, and over the course of, you know, hundreds, thousands, a few thousand years, the Polynesians hopped from island to island and were able to travel back and forth between the islands by using their knowledge of the stars, watching their rising and setting, determining location from that. And over the course of time, they they populated or settled all the islands of the Pacific, all the way down to New Zealand, uh, Aotearoa, to the, to the Maori people, up to uh, Hawaii, and, and all the islands in between, up to Rapa Nui, Easter Island, uh, off the coast of South America, right? It's just incredible uh, human uh, ingenuity that allowed them to do this, these great epic voyages. And so the Hawaiians were great at recognizing the stars in the sky and using these as navigational tools. So what they did, this shows, for example, some of the Hawaiian constellations and some of the stars uh, that are visible now, actually. Um, and they had this amazing knowledge of, of the heavens. And they used this to navigate thousands of miles across the Pacific Ocean, right? They could determine direction from the rising and setting of the stars, um, how high they got uh, above the horizon, that sort of thing. Um, the unfortunate thing is that much of the knowledge of the stars, the Hawaiian knowledge, uh, was lost to history by the, the conquest, by the, um, the upheaval that happened after European contact. So uh, Hawaiian language, as you may or may not know, was not a written language. And so when the missionaries came in the 19th century, uh, they tried to transcribe the names of stars and, and much of the astronomical knowledge of the Hawaiians, but many of these missionaries didn't know much astronomy themselves. So they didn't know which stars the Hawaiians were talking about, for example. And so the, although the Hawaiians had names for hundreds and hundreds of stars and constellations, a lot of that knowledge got lost over time. 
Um, and so that was just one of the consequences of, of contact. Um, but again, the Hawaiians had a really rich uh, astronomical knowledge that allowed them to uh, chart their way across the, the vast ocean and, and come to Hawaii. And so they even have a, a compass that they use now uh, to, uh, to determine direction. And in fact, uh, as you may or may not know, Hawaiian culture is going through a tremendous uh, renaissance, a tremendous revitalization. And a lot of that is tied to this navigation. So in 1980, for example, Nainoa Thompson, a Hawaiian, Native Hawaiian, became the first modern Hawaiian to retrace the steps of his ancestors on one of these voyaging canoes. This is a voyaging canoe called Hokulea, which means the Star of Joy. Um, and the Hawaiians hadn't used their knowledge of the stars to navigate for a long time. That knowledge had been sort of lost, but it was still being used in small uh, halls in Micronesia. And there was a man there who actually taught Nainoa Thompson and some of the other modern navigators, Kalapa Babayan and others, to, uh, to navigate. And so this has been really important for um, instilling pride and, and recognition of the tremendous accomplishment that the Hawaiian people did by being able to navigate across the ocean using their knowledge of the stars, as well as their knowledge of other things like clouds and waves and birds. But the stars played a really, really crucial role in all of this. So anyway, that's all my share, uh, just to give some background, Danielle. Great, thank you. Um, you know, it's really awesome to think that, uh, you know, they could take these modern voyages uh, using the trad traditional star finding methods yep. of navigation. No instruments. Uh, uh, it was, it's incredible. Yeah. And, and just the knowledge to have to, you know, the, the navigators had to know the positions of as many stars in the sky as they could remember, right? Imagine if I had to, you know, memorize a map of the stars overhead. It's just, it's a really incredible accomplishment. It is. And, you know, and, and that's a common theme in cultural astronomy, right? So, um, you know, I'm sure Kyler uh, there in the Torres Straits, you know, we know that astronomy was used for navigation. Mm -hmm. um, and then in the um, deserts of Arabia, uh, you know, sand dunes change over time as the wind blows and, and reshapes the dunes. And so uh, it was the stars were used for navigation there as well. So it's, um, you know, a nice common theme. Um, why don't we uh, get started and look at, uh, as our first star grouping, um, the famed Pleiades star cluster. And uh, I will share my screen here. Um, and uh, I'm gonna be sharing uh, my screen of uh, Starry Night. Uh, this is a great program uh, to visualize the night sky uh, from around the world and at different time periods. And so uh, today we're going to be focusing on primarily this region of the sky. Um, up here we have the famous Pleiades star cluster, the seven sisters of Greek lore. Um, and then moving in this direction, we have uh, the constellation Orion with its belt. And then further down, we have uh, Sirius, and we'll see another bright star, uh, Canopus. So right now, this view that we're looking at is the view from Lowell Observatory. So if we go forward a little bit, yep, there's Canopus. Um, here at Lowell Observatory, Canopus uh, is extremely far south. Uh, it gets up to about two degrees altitude above the horizon, which pretty much means you can never see it unless you have a perfect night with no dust in the air and a perfectly flat southern horizon. Um, uh, Canopus is the second brightest star in the sky. So uh, we'll see more of that as we go. But generally, this is uh, what we'll be looking at today. Uh, if we have time, we'll also swing around to the north and look at the Big Dipper uh, region of sky. So um, uh, I guess I'll go first here since we're already in the northern hemisphere. Um, so if we're looking at the, the Pleiades star cluster and focusing there, uh, let me switch over to share a few slides here. Okay, so here um, in Arabia, 
uh, the Pleiades star cluster was called a Thuraya, uh, which um, has something to do with uh, moisture as well as uh, abundance um, or plenty. And so as we look at uh, the Pleiades, with your own eye, without any telescope, you can see that there's between seven and 15 stars, depending on your eyesight. And so uh, in Arabia, this star grouping was so renowned, it was often called just simply a Nejim, uh, the star or the asterism. So when you read uh, classical Arabic poetry, anytime it just says the star, it's actually talking about the Pleiades star cluster. And over time, uh, this uh, star cluster was anthropomorphized with two arms. Um, so we have one arm here going out to um, the amputated hand, Kef El Jivmat. And uh, one of our star names is Kef El Jivma, uh, which comes from that Arabic term. So um, there's not a lot of structure in uh, this direction. But then if we go, in the other direction, we have a longer arm, um, which ends in the henna dyed hand, al kaf al khadib. And uh, one of the stars here in uh, modern day Cassiopeia is called Kef um, in honor of this. Um, it's an orangish star um, reflecting that color of henna. And so uh, here in this arm, Actually, there are a lot of uh, parts that were identified. Uh, so for example, we have um, you know, the hand, we have uh, this circle identifies uh, the famous double star cluster in Perseus. And so that was seen to be the tattoo on the wrist of that hand uh, or arm. Uh, and then going up, you have um, stars that mark uh, the elbow and the pit of the elbow and the tip of the elbow and the forearm and the upper arm and the shoulder and the shoulder blade, all very, very uh, delineated uh, in the night sky. So we have these two great arms of Athuraya, and um, when they set um, just ahead of the sunrise, uh, they indicated that um, the heavy rains of fall were coming. And so again, you've got that sense of moisture and abundance. Um, but then there was also this, this interesting um, kind of love triangle. So we've got Athuraya here. Um, the red star behind it, um, today we call Aldebaran, and that's because in Arabic it's called Adebaran, uh, very similar, and it literally means the follower. Uh, and so it's the follower of Athuraya. So Athuraya uh, was seen as this uh, um, woman figure, and Adebaran was her suitor, um, and they were engaged to be married. But another bright star in the area here, um, in Arabic, this was al ayuk called uh, the impeder. Um, today, we call this star Capella in, um, uh, in Greek, uh, Orija or Ariga. Uh, depending how you pronounce that constellation. So uh, the impeder uh, prevented the two from getting together. And so forever, um, a Debaran chases a Thuraya across the sky, but they never get together. Um, and there's this one really beautiful piece of Arabian poetry that talks about um, a Debaran being a red turbaned camel uh, herder who is driving uh, a group of camels to chase after um, another group of female camels, uh, which is uh, represented by a thuraya. And so they're being chased across the sky, uh, which is uh, really quite poetic. So um, that's a, uh, an overview of how um, uh, Arabs in Arabia uh, long ago saw the, these groups of stars. And, um, and how many stars were pulled into the story of Athuraya. So I'll go ahead and, and stop my share. Can I ask you a question, Danielle? Yeah. So in, in Hawaiian culture, for example, often there's multiple names for the same star. Is that true in Arabic astronomy or is it? 
Yes, absolutely. Um, in fact, uh, you know, so if we look at Athuraya, we saw it was also called Anejim, uh, which was a very special name. It's kind of like, um, uh, you know, it was such a general name, but applied to that star specifically. Um, but when we look at uh, the follower, Adebaran, it was also called um, other variations that meant follower. So um, one was uh, Tali Anejim, which is the follower of the star, um, or Hadi Anejim, which is the, the urger or the driver of the star. And that reflects that um, piece of poetry, um, uh, seeing Adebaran as a, as a red turbaned camel driver. Um, and then also it had a very special name um, that is um, you know, even mentioned in uh, early Islamic sources. It was called El Mijdah, which meant the stirrer up of rain. So mm -hmm. just as when a Thuraya was setting, um, it indicated heavy rains that continued with a Debaran. And so it was uh, called the stirrer up of rain. So yeah, that's a, a real integral part of Arabian astronomy that you have this, um, what we call mul multivalency, where you can use different names in different contexts. And uh, that's really neat that that was present in Hawaiian astronomy as well. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, uh, maybe Michael, do you want to talk about uh, the Pleiades in Hawaii? Yeah, sure. So um, the Pleiades played a really, really important role in Hawaiian culture. Um, as I said, most of the stars were used for navigation to sort of determine direction when the voyaging canoes would travel from island to island and across the Pacific Ocean. But the Pleiades, more than anything, played a vital role in the Hawaiian calendar, for example. They're so important that the Pleiades are actually mentioned in the Kumulipo chant. The Kumulipo chant is the um, it's a chant that recounts the creation of, of the universe, the, the Hawaiian creation of the universe and the Hawaiian genealogy, the origin of the Hawaiian people. Uh, it's a 2,000, 2,100 line chant. Because uh, again, the Hawaiian language was, a, was an oral, not a written language. Um, and so I think it's line five or line seven, I forget, of the Kumulipo chant specifically mentions the Pleiades uh, created out of the darkness. Um, so it's really played an important role in Hawaiian culture forever. Um, there's a, the Hawaiian New Year is called Makahiki. And, or in, in um, New Zealand, because again, it was... Polynesians settled all these different regions, it's called Matariki. Um, but in Hawaii, uh, uh, Makaliki, the, the constellation is the Pleiades, it means the little eyes. And the Hawaiian New Year starts when the Pleiades begin to rise above the horizon at sunset. Uh, and so the Hawaiian New Year is called uh, Makahiki. And it's, the Hawaiian New Year is kind of divided into two parts. Makahiki is a four month um, celebration in a sense. It's a celebration of the harvest. It's a peaceful period. So in ancient Hawaii, for example, sometimes there were wars between neighboring islands and different, different kingdoms. And, um, and that all had to stop during this period of the new year, during the um, Makahiki. Uh, and so it played a really, really crucial role. So the Makahiki period, the new year period, lasts about four months starting in um, late October or early November and, and going through February, basically. Basically what happens is when the Pleiades begin to rise above the horizon at sunset, uh, the Hawaiian calendar is a, a, a lunar-based calendar. So when the next full moon happens after that, that's the start of the new year. And so uh, Hawaiians, uh, it's a time of peace, as I said. It's a time of uh, celebrating the harvest. It's a time of games. It's a time of hula. Uh, it's, it's just a great time. Um, the Hawaiian expression for uh, the New Year, to wish somebody a happy New Year, is um, haoli uh, makahiki ho. I apologize to anybody for my bad Hawaiian pronunciation. Um, but, you know, makahiki and, and the Pleiades played a really, really crucial role in, in Hawaiian culture, in particular in the Hawaiian calendar. And uh, there's a question here from Terry. Um, uh, who's asking about the, the Pleiades as uh, being guiding stars. Um, and uh, uh, Michael, I see that you answered that in chat, but would you maybe just talk about- um, Sure, of course. Their role? 
So the Pleiades, as you said, Danielle, they're they're pretty obvious, right? It's a pretty obvious clump of stars in the sky. Um, so the Hawaiians were obviously well aware of this. Uh, and so, again, the, the incredible thing about the Hawaiians is they would use all of the stars that they could see to determine direction in their voyaging canoes, right? So uh, if you're out at sea and you saw the Pleiades rising, or you saw where the Pleiades were in the sky, you could figure out things like your latitude, for example, and know if you were heading to Tahiti, if you were heading in the right direction to Hawaii, if you're heading in the right direction to Rapa Nui. Um, so uh, the Pleiades were used. There are other stars that were used as well, but the Hawaiians were really clever. And, you know, they used every star that they could. And in fact, if you imagine navigating uh, during the night, right, under the canopy of the stars, different stars would rise uh, uh, at different times. The higher the star gets in the sky, in some ways, the more difficult it becomes to determine direction. Um, it's, the best way is when they're just starting to rise, they're low on the horizon. So they would use different stars throughout the night to navigate. And the Pleiades would have been one of these groups of stars that they would use. And in Hawaiian navigation, uh, there's a unique element in that, um, uh, you know, it, it varies slightly depending on time of the year, but many times uh, the navigation stars are going up straight overhead, right? They're not uh, creating it, an arc um, in the sky so much as going straight up overhead and then straight down in the west. I mean, if you're at the equator, they would go straight up. Hawaii is at a latitude of about 20 degrees. So they go at an angle of about, you know, 20 degrees. But yeah, they go. So for example, um, there are some stars, we'll talk about some of these later, but there are some stars that were known to be overhead uh, of the islands you wanted to reach. So for example, in the island of Hawaii, or all the islands of Hawaii, the star um, Arcturus, which is known as Hokulea in Hawaiian, the star of joy, uh, was overhead of the Hawaiian Islands. So if you saw Arcturus, if you saw Hokulea at the zenith, then you knew you were at the right latitude to eventually intersect with the islands of Hawaii. So they use different stars like that, yeah. Great. Um, uh, okay, uh, I think this is connected uh, for you, Michael, uh, from Terry Pantano. Um, does that period of peace correlate with big storms making passage between islands uh, difficult? Uh, well, it's, it's, I think, if I remember right, it's the rainy season, essentially, right? So um, I don't know if it made passage between the islands difficult or not. That's a good question. I'm not really sure. Uh, but certainly it's, it's the time when the rains, it's rainier than usual. I lived in Hilo, which is like the rainiest city in the United States. So it rains all the time. But um, uh, yeah, it's rainier. Okay. Uh, okay, uh, Kyler, uh, how were the Pleiades seen um, south of the equator in Aboriginal Australia? Yeah, I'll just give a, a brief introduction in general to Aboriginal Australian. And when I, when I say that, there, there's not one Aboriginal Australia be, because there's not what just one people group or one language. This is a, a map, um, literally just a, a picture of one I have up on my wall that um, shows all the different um, tribes, all the groups throughout Australia and the Torres Strait Island area. And there's uh, hundreds. So they, they all had um, their different stories, different traditions. Uh, some of them were, of course, the, the nearby ones would often communicate with each other, have uh, joint meetings and, and festivities and so on. But, for example, the, the people in Alice Springs in the center had very, very different stories than, say, the St Torres Strait Islanders did in far north Queensland. Uh, but the Pleiades, interestingly, were, were viewed as the, the Seven Sisters as well, much like in, in many other cultures, somehow they were anthropomorphic morphized female um, in, in many, many different cultures. Also, they were, they were being pursued by a lover. Sometimes it is Orion. Sometimes it is uh, the morning star Venus. Um, sometimes it's the Southern Cross, which was uh, viewed as an eagle in, in some of, by some of the groups in Aboriginal Australia. Um, in particular, the, the story about Orion is interesting. Um, in that they 
they didn't want him. And, and at least some of the, the cultural stories, this was someone who was pursuing the sisters that, that they were not interested in. They already had the, the, the man that they were betrothed to or married to. So this was sort of an, an illegitimate suitor. And so they were trying to get away from him in this guy. So it's not exactly a, a love story. Um, but that's, that's at least one of the tellings of uh, who the, the Pleiades are and, and their role in the, the culture uh, some of the cultures in Aboriginal Australia. So there's a lot about sort of um, familial relations. Sometimes the the um, Orion who's pursuing them, they're not allowed to marry because he's from the, the wrong tribe or the wrong group. Um, so it's sort of reinforcing the, the cultural mores um, in, in these stories. The, you know, there's the the other star nearby or whatever. The, there's the, the man they're allowed to marry and then there's the man they're not. So there's uh, the in in addition to as as Michael said there's there's navigational aids that are used in uh, Aboriginal Australian culture as well called song lines but there's also a lot of reinforcement of the the cultural stories the mores the, what what they're supposed to be doing how they're supposed to act um, involved a lot with hunting and um, a lot of the other other practices as well and. You know, that, that brings up a, a good um, illustration. Um, one of uh, our viewers asked, uh, why do we name stars? And, you know, already in this short time, you know, we've addressed a, a number of different uses for the stars, right? So, um, you know, Kyler, you're, you're talking about um, societal norms and taboos reflected in the sky. Um, We've been talking about navigation. Uh, we've been talking about seasonal forecasting, um, and you know, so these are all really practical uses of the stars. And of course, you know, it's much easier to have a common knowledge and say, okay, this bright star is called, you know, this name, and everyone knows it, so you can mm -hmm. have a common vocabulary, and you know. I always imagine uh, people sitting around the campfire at night uh, telling stories about the various stars mm -hmm. in the sky. And, you know, I think that is one mechanism um, by which uh, some of these individual stars, you know, grew and added elements like um, we saw in the, the case of uh, the Pleiades in, in Arabia as a Thuraya getting two arms, you know, Sure, they didn't start out with two arms, but over time, stories were told, and and she got two arms. Um, and that's one of the the roles of the Aboriginal elders in in their culture as well. Um, they were the repository of of knowledge. Again, like Hawaii, there was a lot of oral tradition that was passed on from the elders to the younger generation, and some of the elders were were said to have known the names of three thousand stars. So every story they had in their, their culture associated with the stars, someone would have to know the name of it. They'd have to know the navigation light, the, the song light, how to get from where they are to their their neighboring uh, tribe, say. And that was the, the job of the elder to remember that and to pass it along. So they had to know, just have a particular knowledge of the sky, all the names, when it would rise and set at different times of the year, whether that meant it's now dingo breeding season, or it's uh, shark breeding season in the Torres Strait Islands, so stay out of the water. There's a lot of different, very important um, cultural memories that, that the elders would have and would, would pass on for uh, tens of thousands of years in some cases. Yeah, Carl, I, I read somewhere that, uh, you know, the Aboriginal Australians have the longest tradition of stargazing of any peoples today. Um, so if you think about that long tradition and it, that map you showed of all the different uh, groups in Australia, it must be an incredibly rich, uh, you know, mythology of the of the heavens, basically stories of the heavens and, and cultural connections. Yes, when when their culture extends um, tens of thousands of years, somewhere in the forty to fifty thousand year range, um, there's a lot of uh, a lot of stories that will accumulate. Uh, what's interesting also is because of uh, precession of the the stars, because the Earth's rotation varies. Um, on its axis, it wobbles a bit, and because of proper motion, some of the stars aren't where they were 40,000 years ago, aren't in the same groupings. So their, their cultural uh, 
memory and their cultural stories would have to change as the, the star position shifted. So it's almost talking on, a, on an astronomical or geological time scale. Some of these stories are, are remembered. There's also stories of um, fire raining down from the sky. Um, and that's traced to um, craters from asteroid impacts that are thousands of years ago. And these stories were preserved in their culture over, over thousands of years. That's amazing. Yeah, that's phenomenal. The other thing that's um, interesting too, I think, is that, you know, talking about these three different cultures, right, in, in the Arab lands, in Hawaii, and in, in Australia, the, I mean, we'll talk more about this in a second, but just the, the people see different things in the sky, you were saying this before, Danielle, that reflect their cultures, right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, the, the Big Dipper, the Great Bear in, in you know, to some of us, uh, there's no bears in Hawaii, so they didn't have a great bear, right? Uh, and they saw the things that were part of their culture, I'm sure in, in, in Australia and in, in the, the Arab lands as well, so. Yeah, that's really something I love about cultural astronomy is that um, it's the same data, it's the same points of light. And so all of the differences that you see are the result of, of culture and these different interpretations. Mm -hmm. Oh, I think Kyler, you're muted. Kyler, Kyler you're muted. Sorry, I, as I, I'm showing here, this is um, Baidam, the shark in uh, Torres Strait Islander tradition. Here's an artistic rendering of it. So, as Michael was saying, you know, no bears in Hawaii. They had a, a different meaning to the the Big Dipper, and here it is in in the Torres Strait Islander. Um, memory it is it's a shark and so for example if if we show it in the sky later uh, at a certain time of year it's its nose is touching the, the the water the surface of the water just at sunset and for for them that was a time of when when sharks are breeding so that was um, important for you know hunting for being aware of the the dangers in the water when when you're um, living in the water around the, the Torres Strait, you have to know what the, the behavior of the, the, the predators in the area to expect. So that's an important uh, story that, that they would tell to, to make sure they, they knew the, the right time of year when, when they needed to watch out for this particular danger in the water. Yep. Uh, no bears there either, right? <laughs> uh, just but, drop bears. <laughs> um, just the koalas. Uh, let's move on to uh, the constellation of uh, Orion, which is, you know, really one of the most recognizable star patterns um, in our current skies uh, right now. And uh, to introduce Orion, I just wanted to um, go back to uh, our Starry Night program uh, so people can get a, a really good sense of um, how much the view of the sky changes as you change location. So um, uh, as we last left it, uh, we're here uh, still in Arizona at Lowell Observatory. Orion is nicely high in the sky. Um, the zenith is right here at the very top. So we're looking at horizon to the top of the sky and Orion is about in the middle there. Now, if we were to go to um, say Sana'a, uh, Yemen, and I'll go there quickly. Now, um, we see that Orion is even higher in the sky, right? So that's the zenith up top, and Orion is almost there. Canopus is easily visible, um, uh, quite high enough in the sky, some 20 degrees or more. Um, but then, if we go to, uh, say, Mauna Kea in Hawaii, and let me change to nighttime again and flip around to the south. Now, in this view, uh, let's go a little bit further. Uh, yep, so uh, about similar uh, to what we saw in Sanaa. So Orion pretty close to the zenith, but not quite there. Uh, and Canopus quite high. And then if we go, uh, say, to uh, the Taurus Strait, and again, 
oops, let me advance it so we get to the darkness again. Okay, now, um, oops, uh, we have something different going on here. Um, okay, so now we've got Canopus here quite high about halfway up the sky, 47 degrees. And Orion is way, way up at the zenith, past the zenith of the sky. So that, in fact, um, if you look around to the north, Orion, uh, okay, so this is about northwest here. Orion is, from our perspective here in Arizona, upside down. But this is how Orion normally appears, um, as seen from... Uh, Australia, New Zealand, um, the whole Southern Hemisphere. And uh, so that is a really good uh, example of how much these star patterns change. I thought perhaps, uh, Kyler, you could um, show us that beautiful image of Orion uh, that you've got. Yes. Yeah, tell us about this, where it was taken So this this particular image is actually a view from from Chile. Um, okay. So it's yep. um, but as Danielle said, if you're at the same northern or southern latitude, you'll see the stars in the same way. They just rise at different times of the night. So this is the view that you would also have from Australia. So I I saw this is not my picture, but I, I did see this view when I would visit Chile to do observing. And then the whole time I was living in Australia, this is what Orion would look like. Sometimes he's on his side, but he is, um, he, the, the, um, the sword of Orion uh, doesn't hang down from his belt. It, it points up. And in uh, some of the Aboriginal traditions, this was actually a, a canoe, a boat, this um, little juice, the red star was the, uh, the bow, and uh, Rigel was the stern. And in this particular story, the, the brothers who, would, who were uh, sailing in the canoe, and they caught a fish. So they're, the brothers are, are sitting along the belt here, and the fish is the Orion Nebula, what we would call the sword. And this is a reminder not to actually uh, the, eat a particular type of fish. Again, this is a, a cultural taboo that, that this particular constellation, um, w when it's linked to the story, tells that you don't eat, I think it was a, a, a swordfish actually, that, that they were not allowed to eat. Um, so this is um, what Orion looks like from the south and that's the, the story that was told uh, to match the constellation to the, the culture that the people were in. That's awesome, Orion as a canoe. <laughs> I, I gotta add, I, I lived in Chile for seven years. I never got used to seeing the sky upside down. <laughs> I'm sorry, it's just, you know, it's not what you grew up with, right? It's, and the Southern sky is so beautiful. Kyler can vouch for this. I always say, I don't understand why everyone who lives in the Southern hemisphere is not an astronomer. The sky is just dazzling, but it's upside down from, my, from what you're used to if you grew up in North, the Northern hemisphere. Um, how did the Hawaiians see the stars of Orion? Um, yeah, let me share my screen really quick, Danielle. Um, the, uh, sorry, just trying to find my presentation. And as you're getting that set up, um, just a note to our viewers that um, uh, we'll be wrapping up here uh, in a few minutes. So uh, if you have any uh, last questions, uh, be sure to uh, mention them in chat and uh, we'll do our best to get to them. So can you see that okay, Daniel? Mm -hmm. So the, the, to the Hawaiians, the, what we call the constellation of Orion was known as Kahehe Onakeki. Uh, he is the Hawaiian word for a, a string game. It's like Cat's Cradle, if you've ever played that. Um, and they saw, and I think it's a really brilliant description of this constellation because Orion is so regular, right? And there's a little drawing here, I hope you can see, showing uh, like a Cat's Cradle. Hawaiians had, I think, more than 100. 50 known string games, they really like those. So he is the word for uh, a string game, keiki is the Hawaiian word for children. Uh, and so that's how they saw this. It was like a, a cat's cradle kind of game in the heavens, which I think is a really nice description of how Orion looks.
That's really neat. And that, that reflects the, um, um, the symmetry that you see in Orion yeah. uh, with its, you know, very well lined up belt stars um, and then the brighter stars on either side. Yeah. Um, that's, that's similar. Um, the, the symmetry was noted also in Arabia. Um, the uh, Arabs called um, the three stars of the belt al uh, which is a name that has to do with um, something being the middle of um, two other things. And so we have that symmetry in the belt, but also the belt itself has that, is in the middle uh, of um, the two brightest stars, um, Betelgeuse and Rigel. Yeah, Orion's amazing. It's such an obvious constellation. And, you know, it's, it's one of the ones that every culture that has, has a legend about it, basically, right? Mm-hmm, yep. And uh, uh, let me share uh, a view of Orion here um, in Arabia, because we actually have a lot of um, uh, Arabian astronomy residuals in our modern day Orion. So the three stars of the belt um, are each called Anitak, Al-Nilam, and Mintaka, which uh, in Arabic, um, mean the belt or um, the string of pearls. And uh, so those names all survive direct from the Arabic. And then um, uh, the bright star Rigel uh, is coming from the Arabic Rigel, which literally means foot. So, uh, but in Arabia, it was the foot of uh, al Jozat, not the foot of Orion until Greek astronomy came in. And then likewise, uh, Betelgeuse, um, is a kind of distorted form of the Arabic Yed el Jozat, um, uh, the dots above and below characters in Arabic change the consonants. And so that Y sound became a B when one of the two dots were dropped in a transcription um, uh, during uh, the time that it was brought into um, Latin. And so, um, that Yed El Jozat literally means the hand of El Jozat. So our star Betelgeuse really harkens back to that um, non-Greek figure of El Jozat as a, a female figure, not of the Greek male giant. Um, so uh, yeah, so we even have some survivals in the modern sky that we see. See, for the Hawaiians, they were much more practical with the name of Betelgeuse. It was um, Kaulua Koko, which means the bright red star, basically. Um, <laughs> That's very descriptive. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, you know, I, I think that reflects a little bit in the cultures, too, right? Um, in Arabian astronomy, too, there's a lot of star names that are just descriptive. Um, and they were useful, right? When you're trying to learn these, you know, in, in the case of Aboriginal Australia, 3,000 star names, um, you know, you want the star name to really reflect what you're seeing um, and make good use of it um, versus, you know, in Greek astronomy, you've got lots of things that, you know, it's really hard to make out in the night sky um, from what they imagine, but that's because in Greek culture, by that point, um, they were infusing um, their theology into the night sky. So they were um, sometimes not starting with, oh, here's the star pattern. It looks like this. They were starting with, you know, where do we put Pegasus in the sky? Because that's in our stories. Or where do we put, you know, this other God that's in our stories in the sky? And so um, some of those are a bit hard to see. The, 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 the cultural practices of, of Australia where they have this, this moral, this story they want to tell, and then they map that onto the sky. Although in the cases I showed, like with, uh, um, with Orion or with Bite on the Shark, the, the constellations are a bit more obvious in, in those particular cases. Mm -hmm. Yep. I think it's interesting what you say, Danielle, about you know, so many of the names of the brighter stars that we use today have, are Arabic in origin. And yet we don't always know the stories that go with them at all, right? Which is, is interesting in that sense. Yeah. 
Yeah, it's uh, it's quite amazing. And, you know, as you can see, uh, we're, uh, we're at time now, and we've basically talked about two star groupings. Um, so we could go on and on for hours. So uh, if you'd like us to do more of these kinds of uh, cultural astronomy based um, uh, chats, uh, let us know in the comments in YouTube and uh, we'll, um, we'll certainly be back um, for more cultural astronomy. Um, Maybe six months from now we can talk about the summer constellations, at least the Northern Hemisphere summer. Yeah, Southern Hemisphere winter, absolutely. Um, so thank you again, uh, Dr. Michael West and Dr. Kyler Keene uh, for being here today. And, um, you know, I think thank it's you. been a, a great conversation to talk about um, these star groupings across different cultures. I learned a lot. <laughs> <laughs> Indeed. Um, so uh, thank you all, uh, those who are viewing here. And um, uh, please join us again next week for Cosmic Coffee. Uh, I believe uh, our director, Jeff Hall, will be back as host next week. Uh, and then also remember that on Tuesday nights, we have interactive stargazing. Uh, we were um, clouded and snowed out um, this week for interactive stargazing, but hopefully the weather holds out next week. Um, until then, thanks so much and have a fantastic day. <laughs>